pretty much uh, the um, uh, end of the Roman Empire. I will review a little bit on the M Roman Empire as well. Uh, and, um, and then, of course, I will start getting into, of course, talking about the Middle Ages uh, as well. So that's one of my major uh, issues I will be talking about today uh, pretty much. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I do have the um, – We'll pull it up real quick here. I do have the uh, lecture, uh, which I, I'm going to continue uh, using this lecture pretty much from last time. Although I do have a new one uh, that I do have, which I'll show you right here on the Middle Ages, which I have posted uh, uh, to, uh, I think, the announcement on Canvas pretty much. But I'm going to first finish this section here, of course, talking about the end of the empire mostly the Western Empire at this point. Uh, and I'll do a little review uh, as well, uh, all the topics going back to the period of the five good emperors. Uh, and then I'll move on to talk about the Middle Ages. It's pretty much what I'll do today uh, overall. So uh, anyway, uh, from last time, I believe I had talked about the fact that the, I told you how the cause of the Western Empire collapsing was mostly due to the various barbarian invasions. I think I did this already. Kind of, I'll kind of review it again and talk about it again. But that's one of the major issues that caused it. It's not the only issue uh, that caused it, pretty much. But um, pretty much all the different Germanic peoples and other non-German peoples that entered uh, into the Roman Empire. It's pretty much what led to the to the demise of the Roman Empire which was eventually broken up. And I think I told you from previously that it was part of a migration period uh, that they call the von, the Volder, the, yeah, Volker Wandering, uh, is how the Germans actually say it, uh, which means the wandering of the people, uh, which started way back, probably down the time of Marcus Aurelius, the second century. Uh, you had all these Germ German peoples migrating from Germania or, Ger or Germany into uh, the Roman Empire, they're like waves of them that came. And it pretty much happens between well, the peak of it's about fourth to about the eighth centuries BC uh, that you have all these different peoples, you know, coming coming into uh, Western Europe, Western Central Europe uh, overall. And um, I think we were talking about last time uh, the different ones. Um. Yeah, there's not going to be any more assignments. That's it. There's no more Canvas quiz if you're wondering about that. Yeah, right, Michaela. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so just just got the vocab and the final. That's all you got left pretty much coming up later. But um, anyway, we were talking about, I think I had mentioned all of them, right? I don't know if I did that or not. Went into all the different peoples that came in. I thought it did, but I'll go through them again if I didn't remember about that. But yeah, those are all the different uh, Germanic peoples that overran the Roman Empire. You got the Goths, which are probably the most famous ones, uh, which were in two different groups, uh, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. Uh, the names, by the way, meant, um, I think Visigoth meant Eastern Goth and Ostrogoth meant Western Goth or something like that. That's what it actually means. Uh, Vandals, the Franks, Burgundians, Anglo-Saxons, the Jutes are usually put in together as the Anglo-Saxons. Those are some of them uh, that kind of enter the empire. Now, I think I may have mentioned this before, but a lot of the uh, Romans wanted to hire all these Germans into their armies uh, because they were short of men, you know, for the military. And they're often called uh, auxiliary forces. They were dubbed a nickname. They were called the Federati, uh, which meant, uh, I think it meant ally is what it meant. But they fought as mercenaries with the other Roman troops. And um, by the time of the end of the Roman Empire, most of the Roman armies, especially in the West, are all mostly Germanic uh, that they have. And um, they also were brought in because they need taxation. So a lot of them, you know, they were given citizenship and then they were taxed, you know, all that. Uh, I didn't really get into the different groups. I think I was just showing you, uh, I think from the other day last week, the map of the different um, Germanic peoples that entered the empire. 
And uh, we'll get, of course, the Huns. I may have already done this already. I don't remember exactly. I forgot. But I'll go through them again anyway. Uh, but the Vandals, the Vandals were the first group that came that came in. Actually, not the Vandals. It was the Visigoths, who were pretty vicious. Uh, and um, they entered uh, uh, the eastern part of the Roman Empire. You can kind of see in the map over here. Uh, they came in where that purple area is right here. I'll show you. But they... They came in right here, and um, what happened was um, there was an emperor named, I think Emperor Valens, I think was his name, let him in, and what happened was uh, they they basically were treated badly, the Goths, uh, and so they formed their own armies and attacked the Roman Empire. And in 378, the Battle of Adrianople, it's called, uh, the emperor of the Romans, Valens, was actually killed. He was killed in battle. And from there, the um, Visigoths were able to march through uh, and actually attack Rome, which they did in the year 410, 410 uh, CE. And they kept marching westward until what happened with the Huns was that the uh, what happened with the um, Visigoths, they settled in Spain. They created their own state there, later called the Visigothic Kingdom. It was nicknamed. Oh, they also had the Ostrogoths, who were kind of like cousins of the Visigoths. They also came westward too, took over Italy. They formed their own state too, called the Ostrogothic Kingdom. So basically the, these Germanic people start carving up the whole state. It's what they do. I can expand it if you want. Um, then, of course, you got the Vandals. The Vandals was another one that came out of Germany. And uh, they also attacked the West, too. And uh, they actually came through France and what is Spain. You can go down to the bottom here. They actually crossed the Mediterranean Sea into, into what is uh, North Africa. You can see them coming down this way. They eventually seized Carthage, which is right here. They also took over Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica over here. And also, it's interesting, too, about the uh, Vandals. Vandals also sacked Rome in two, 455. It got so bad, the Romans, I don't know if you know this or not, Rome wasn't the capital. You know, they got the star on there and all that, but Romans actually in the west moved the capital to the northern Adriatic right here to a city called Ravenna. It's called R-A-V-E-N-N-A. -N -N yeah, Ravenna. That actually was the capital of the Roman Empire at the end of, end of the west. Most people don't know that. So you got those two groups um, practically sacking the West, you know, going on. Uh, then, then in Germany, they had the Franks. Uh, and they also had the Burgundians, I think it was another group, uh, across the Rhine River. Franks were like a Germanic people, like in Western Germany. And they settled in what is called Gaul or France, as they called it later, uh, which was the kingdom of the Franks, or they called it for short, Francia, or France for short. And uh, so that, that group took over Gaul or France at that point. Uh, then you can see way up there in the north. So the one you were looking at uh, was like in that map. Uh, yeah, th these are the Franks, the orange ones coming in here. Uh, then you got the Ang Anglo-Saxon peoples who live up in like northern Germany and Denmark. They cross the North Sea, start attacking England, Rome and Britain uh, here. That's actually one of the first places that the Romans actually evacuate. Uh, I think around 410 or so, early 400s, uh, the Romans start getting out of there. So, so all, the whole, whole empire in the West is getting taken over by all these different peoples uh, that you got there. Uh, then, then uh, what happens? So, yeah, what's going to happen later? Of course, we're going to. I'll talk about it later when I get to the Middle Ages. But you're going to see basically all these states in the West start forming. That's the beginning of the Middle Ages. Then the Huns come in. The Huns, you know, were these nomadic peoples that came out of Asia uh, that are well known. Uh, they're the ones in green. You see that map there coming in. And uh, the Huns were related to the Mongolian peoples. Well, at least they think that's the theory about it. Although they theorize that the Huns were descendants from the Xiongnu uh, that went back to when they were attacking China well, a long time ago, they somehow migrated westward along the Silk Road till they reached like parts of Europe. 
they settled in an area that's kind of like right above the Roman Empire, which in that video they call it sometimes, uh, they call it Pannonia, I think is the name that they often dub it. You know, Pannonia, P-A-N-N-O-N-I-A, Pannonia. It's actually a province and part of the empire. And uh, they settle like around where the uh, Danube River rain, River is. The Danube River, that'd be about the, where it is uh, roughly. It's kind of like, like Austria-Hungary would be the region uh, we're talking about. And the Huns were very paganistic. Uh, they weren't Christians. Uh, a lot of people, of course, didn't like the Huns. They were you know, very warlike. Uh, they fought continuously on horseback, as you saw in the video, like the Mongols did later. They were known for fighting with a composite bow, swords, etc. Uh, their greatest king was Attila the Hun, as you saw in the video. He, of course, reigned over uh, the so-called Hunnic Empire or the Empire of the Huns for 15, 20 years, uh, although he shared power with his brother. He had a brother named Bleda who he murdered uh, to seize power. And what happened was Attila's armies became like this uh, parasite, if you want to call it, uh, where they continuously preyed on the Eastern and the Western Roman empires. Basically, they would tell the Romans, hey, if you don't pay us, like tribute money, like gold, etc., we'll attack you. And he kept doing this. And so with that, he was able to build up a huge empire with a huge army, uh, pretty much. And he even tried to attack both, both empires to conquer them at one point. Uh, and um, 440s, he first attacked the Eastern Roman Empire. You can see in that map there, in that green area, you can see he sweeps down there into Greece uh, and attacks, attacks the Eastern Roman Empire. And uh, it got so bad uh, with the Eastern or Byzantine Empire that they had to actually build fortifications. I don't know if you can't see it right here, but uh, the um, Romans in um, the Eastern Empire built like some fortifications right here to block him, uh, the so-called Theodosian Wall, uh, which were which was a huge fortification uh, blocking, you know, them. And their armies were better. Like the armies in the East were better than in the West. Um, so they were able to kind of eventually kick him out and force him to retreat back to uh, Hungary uh, up here. Then at 451, you can see over here, uh, Tilla then launched, of course, his most famous attack, if you know about this. He then across the Rhine River with his forces, and they pushed into Gaul to try to conquer Gaul uh, at that point. And the Romans got so desperate that they brought up an army uh, that was like a Roman um, Germanic army, which had a mostly Federati troops in it. That were Visigoths and Franks uh, they had. And the Battle of Catalonian Fields, which is sometimes called Battle of Chalons, it's called either one. Uh, Attila's forces were actually stopped uh, on June 20th. And that should be, by the way, a typo there. That should be 451 CE or AD, either one. Uh, and um, I think the battle was inconclusive. Neither side really won, but... Um, Tell lost, I guess, so much of his cavalry that he had to retreat uh, back to uh, what is um, back to Hungary at that point, and so that that failed. Uh, and then, of course, actually in 452, <laughs> he attacked the West again, uh, going into Italy, uh, and um, he actually practically sacked and devastated a lot of the northern regions of Italy. Just just sacked and destroyed like multiple cities. That's where he got a lot of his bad name from. I think they talk about sometimes. And uh, but apparently, uh, before he could take the capital of Rome, which actually was Ravenna, not really that one. He was trying to get Ravenna, uh, but um, there was a story where the Pope met with him, uh, who's Pope Leo the Great. They call him Leo the First, and uh, he actually met him and somehow influenced him to withdraw which I don't think they know why, what exactly told him, whatever. He said the wrath of God's going to just kill you, whatever. I don't know. Exactly. They don't really know. It's kind of a mystery about what Pope Leo said, but for some reason it influenced him to retreat back to Hungary again. 
Um, Attila died mysteriously. I don't know if you heard the story, but it's kind of a weird story. But uh, he married this young woman, you know, on his wedding night. He had gotten really drunk, and for some reason, they think he got some kind of bad nosebleed and he drowned in his own blood. Kind of a bizarre death, you know. So I'm not sure what would have happened if Attila would have lived. I'm thinking he would have conquered the West eventually. He created some kind of Hunnic empire in the West, but that that didn't happen. Uh, but they do think that his attacks to the West and all that helped contribute to its decline. Uh, because eventually what happened was in the uh, fifth century, uh, the last Western emperor, Romulus Augustus or Augustus Augustulus, either either one. He's usually Romulus Augustus, but they call him Augustulus, which means little August is what the name means. And um, he was only like, um, I think, 15 when he came became uh, emperor in the West in 475. What happened was the Germanic peoples in Italy forced him to basically step down. And so in 476, at the age of, I think, 16, actually not 16, I got the wrong age. He was only 14, got the wrong year there. 14 years old, he actually was, excuse me. Uh, he was forced to abdicate. And so... Pretty much after that, there's no more emperors um, in the West, like none. Uh, there's you know emperors in the East still, of course, but uh, they're not recognized. And so uh, 476 is often seen as the popular date when the Roman Empire ends, like the Western one uh, overall. And that that actual date uh, was popularized by Edward Gibbon. I don't know if you've heard of Gibbon. Gibbon was an 18th century Roman historian that wrote the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, and he kind of popularized that 476 is the end date of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, however, the Eastern Roman Empire, you can see, still continues. It becomes later known as the Byzantine Empire based around Constantinople. Uh, but it's a weaker state uh, that kind of continues in the Middle Ages that eventually shrinks. It's really not much to it later. It most like around Turkey and Greece is where it is. But at one point, it did include like part of like Egypt, Syria, and all that uh, in the east. But they lost eventually that due to the rise of Islam uh, that occurred. Now, in the west, what happens? The Western Empire becomes a collection of these Germanic states that form afterwards, which I'll get into uh, today. And of course, it leads into the so-called Middle Ages. Uh, as they call it, or medieval times or medieval period that'll eventually follow. Uh, so I'll get to that later uh, today uh, and talk about that. Um, but let me go ahead and move on. I need to go ahead uh, next, of course. I guess the next thing we need to do is I need to do a little review. Uh, what, I, Of course, I will do first. And uh, I, will, I will, of course, will continue with uh, lecturing on the Middle Ages. Because the Middle Ages is pretty much starting right now. All right, so uh, what were these emperors famous for? Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Nerva was the founder of the Nerva dynasty, starts the period of the five good emperors. And uh, Nerva is the one that started the adoption process because then I told you the emperors of that period are called the adoptive emperors. <clears throat> and um, Trajan was the second emperor of the uh, Nerva dynasty. Uh, Trajan um, was famous for his expansionism in the east, like eastern eastern part of the Roman Empire. And uh, he's the one who conquered like Romania, which they called Dacia, he expanded the empire to the Tigris River and maybe Caspian Sea. He also took over the Black Sea area, maybe around the Crimea. And then he also uh, at one point, I think he even expanded the Jordan, like part of part of the um Sahara Desert and all that. Not Sahara, the, yeah, the Arabian Desert. Um, Trajan also was known for Trajan's Forum and all that. Of course, he built in Rome. Uh, Hadrian was his successor. Uh, Hadrian was, of course, a Roman general under Trajan. Both were from Spain. And uh, Hadrian was known for being nicknamed the Greekling uh, because he was famous for his... Um, love of Greek culture. He was a patron of the arts, and he was also an amateur architect. He's the one who built Hadrian's Wall, 
uh, the Pantheon, Pantheon Temple, of course, in Rome. Uh, Antoninus Pius was the founder of the uh, Antonine dynasty, uh, which included Marcus Aurelius, Commodus, and Lucius Verus. And um, his reign was the peak reign of the Pax Romana. It was the most peaceful. He was the third longest reigning ruler in the empire. The successor was Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, of course, was a Roman emperor that was the last of the five good emperors. Uh, he was one that was known as a Stoic philosopher. He was famous for writing that um, book called The Meditations or Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. He was also known for a lot of wars, fought during his reign, fought against the Romans. Uh, he fought the Roman Parthian War uh, out, in, out in the east, like in Iraq and Syria. Uh, and then also he was more known for the Marcomannic Wars, which were fought over the Danube River region against the Germanic peoples that were trying to invade the Roman Empire at the time. That took up most of his reign. Uh, one emperor ended this period in like the Pax Romana when he took power as a tyrannical ruler. Uh, that was, of course, his um, Marcus Aurelius' son, Commodus. Uh, what is the year when some believe the Pax Romana ended? Uh, 180 CE. Uh, who and what dynasty seized control of Rome? Uh, 193. That was the Severan dynasty. Uh, it was founded by uh, Septimius Severus, uh, who was a Roman general, uh, going back to uh, under Commodus. Uh, and he took over the state. Uh, he, of course, he and his family, which I think they had six rulers that were part of it, uh, reigned uh, from, I think it was like, uh, what was the years for that? I think it was two, um, I forget the years, two, I forgot the years for it. I don't have it in front of me, but, um, but it included like, um, he had his two sons that reigned, of course, Gaeta and Caracalla, I think were the two most famous afterwards. Also, Alexander Severus was the other one. And those are the only ones that were re related to all of them. Severans. They had those other two guys that had Elegabalus and Macrinus were not related uh, to them, actually. Uh, also, Septimius Severus was famous for his wife, um, Empress uh, Julia Domna, considered one of the most famous um, empress consorts. I think up there with Theodora, uh, who was the wife of Justinian. Um, let's see what else. Um, what historical period in the third century almost caused the collapse of the Roman Empire? They had what they called the crisis period or, or anarchy, anarchy period of the Roman Empire, chapter in the third century. That's where the Roman Empire almost collapsed uh, around 235 to 284. And uh, there was a period where the Roman Empire broke up into multiple states, like the Palmyrene Empire in the east and I think the Gaelic Empire in the west which kind of broke off from the Roman Empire, but it was later gotten back together eventually. So it almost collapsed uh, at that time. Um, what were these emperors called that, rule, uh, that, that ruled during this period? Uh, they were ruled by what they call the barracks emperors or barracks sol or soldier emperors, they were also called, uh, because of the fact that, that most of the um, emperors came from the army or were chosen by the armies. Uh, the emperor in this period began stabilizing the room with various reforms. That was, of course, Emperor Diocletian came in and took over. Uh, and he created a bunch of reforms. His most famous reform was the one where he created the so-called Tetrarchy, where he divided the empire into four parts with the um, Western and Eastern Roman empires. Uh, and the uh, it had like four emperors that were called like a Tetrarch. So they were called Tetrarchs, basically. And uh, the two main rulers or emperors were called, the Tetrarchs were called a um, Augustus. So well, there was one in the West and there was one in the East. And they had these um, subordinate or vice type emperors or Tetrarch that were below them. Uh, they were called a um, Caesar. So they had a Western Caesar and an Eastern Caesar. Uh, they had below the Augustus. So you had a Western Augustus, an Eastern Augustus. And below that, you had a Western Caesar and an Eastern Caesar. Uh, which Roman leader eventually ended the Tetrarchy uh, due to civil wars? 
That was, of course, um, Constantine the Great. He was also called Constantine the First. Uh, he would, of course, go on to convert to Christianity. Uh, that's kind of out of order. I don't know why I'm doing that one. Forgot I forgot to talk about this one right here. What was the Diocletianic persecution? Let me do that first. Uh, that was where uh, between like a 10-year period under Diocletian, uh, goes like, like about uh, 303 to about 313 CE, uh, Emperor Diocletian and the other Tetrarchs persecuted Christians. Uh, throughout the Roman Empire in an attempt to uh, reform um, the Roman religions and bring back, you know, traditional religions of the pa of pagan pagan cults and all that. And it failed. Uh, it didn't really work. Uh, and I think it made the Christians more stronger as a religion. And uh, Costing the Great, who came in later, later ended it, uh, more or less. Um, let's see. Some of that or some of the stuff that left out. I don't know why they got left. There's a bunch of stuff left out. Or is it just out? Of, oh, it's in the wrong order. That's what happened to it. For some reason, it's out of order. I don't know why, but um, that's out of order. But uh, anyway, um, yeah. What religion did Constantine eventually adopt after the Battle of Milvian Bridge during the Wars of the Tetrarch? That was the Civil Wars of the Tetrarch. They're talking about, of course. Uh, they're talking about Constantine the Great. He would, of course, eventually convert, which is kind of a debate about when it was, but they seem to think he was probably on his deathbed when he actually converted. Edict of Milan, that basically established uh, Christianity as a uh, Roman religion. It was made legal, uh, and it helped to end a lot of the persecutions uh, within the Roman Empire. So it ended the Diocletianic persecutions. Council of Nicaea, of course, met 325, the first one. That was, of course, a ecumenical council of the early Christian church, uh, and it set up a lot of the doctrines and laws of the church. It also established the, the, you know, the Christian Bible uh, at the time, uh, and uh, it also banned uh, Arianism, which was a type of um, heretical form of Christianity uh, that was challenging Trinitarianism. Uh, which Trinitarianism became the main theory about what God was, which God was basically three things that was one, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, they also adopted the Nicene Creed, which was a type of uh, Christian prayer of faith that was put into like the Mass uh, to force Christians to adopt the Trinity. Uh, of course, the Christian Bible was developed too, like the New Testament. Uh, it was pretty much compiled uh, due to the influence by Constantine the Great and the Council of Nicaea. Uh, also, Constantine's the one that founded, of course, the capital in the, uh, the Roman, a new capital, which, of course, became known as Constantinople, uh, which was founded in the year 330, uh, and it later became the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, which was called Byzantine later, because it was built on top of this old Greek city called um, Byzantium. Byzantium. And um, uh, the, uh, what happened later after the Western Empire collapsed, uh, th this became the capital of that state, you know, basically up to like the 15th century. And uh, it was built, the, ca the capital of Constantinople was built uh, in Western Turkey, but on the European side, uh, south of the Black Sea. So it's kind of actually in the Sea of Marmara, they call it today. Uh, Theodosius the Great was famous, of course, as a ruler uh, for being one of the last um, emperors to uh, unify the whole empire as one state. So he actually was sole ruler of the Roman Empire for like three or four years. I think it was like three, 392 to 395, I think it was. And Theodosius was the one that forced uh, the uh, Romans to adopt Christianity as, their, as, as a monotheistic religion. And so under him, he created a uh, monotheistic Christian state, which the Roman Empire was the first to do. And uh, this happened in like the 380s. Um, I think I told you the Edict of Thessalonica was the one that started it all. So Nicene Christianity was forced on everybody. What was the cause of the decline of the Western Union? I think I told you that already, but the, the invasion of the Germanic peoples that, that came in uh, afterwards, for some reason that was out of order. I noticed that right here. It was supposed to be like down here, which I already went through. 
talked about all the different um, ones there were. Uh, I think I told you the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, uh, the Vandals, the Franks, Anglo-Saxons. Those are all the main ones that pretty much were the ones that were the Germanic ones. We've already kind of talked about all the areas that they occupied, all that too already. Now we talked about Attila the Hun already. I think we did that today already, talking about that. Uh, how he tried to attack the West, which that helped to pretty much precipitate the decline of the Western Empire. Now, I told you how Romulus Augustus was the one that was the last Roman emperor in the West uh, who stepped down in 476. He was he was only 14, actually, I think was the actual age. I'm going to go ahead and move on, of course, next. I'm kind of, I don't want to get too far behind here on this, but I need to move on to talk about next uh, the... Um, the middle, I need to get in the Middle Ages today and get, get into that uh, overall. And um, the Middle Ages is a period that kind of is around the, between like about from like 500 to about 1500 CE or AD. That's the time period usually of, of when it is pretty much. So that's, that's a rounded off amount. So it happens like around a period of about a thousand years, uh, roughly. They call it different names, the Middle Ages, Medieval Period, Medieval, medieval Times, uh, they call it all kinds of things. And it begins from the fall of the Western Empire, and it goes up to like the Renaissance. That would be like the time period of mostly when the Middle Ages was about uh, overall. And um, go back to that screen I was showing you a second ago. And um, the term med medieval, just by the way, it means Middle Age. It means the same thing. That's where the name comes from. It's a term that goes back to, I think, the Renaissance was when they start kind of using that term. It's kind of like a middle period. It's exactly what it is. It's a middle period or between period uh, that occurs between when the empire fell in the West uh, and when the modern times comes in later. And usually they think Renaissance is the term, of course, that they use or when maybe it starts, I guess, the modern times. And... Um, the term Dark Ages, uh, they think, was coined, which is one of the nicknames, you know, they call uh, the medieval period, the medieval Dark Ages anyway, if that term was coined by the Italian writer Petrarch, who lived in the 14th century, uh, who was one of the founders, by the way, of, of the Renaissance. He was like a humanist. Uh, and um, so that's, that's when it starts happening. And that's the most famous period, really, of the, of, of the Middle Ages is the early part of it. You know, when you got all this stuff going on, uh, and uh, there's a debated period. There's a there's a debate about when the Middle Ages start. You'll see all kinds of. I know I said 500, but 500 is not really the date when it starts. It's like a number they make up, uh, more or less. But you could probably go back to the third century when they started having all those problems uh, they were having under the Roman Empire when it was starting to decline and break up and get invaded. Uh, and so you could go all the way back to that period, maybe after the Severan dynasty kind of collapsed, uh, et cetera. Uh, chronologically, they usually divide the Middle Ages into three sub-periods, which I'll go through today. Uh, you've got the early Middle Ages. You've got the high Middle Ages, sometimes called the central Middle Ages. And then you got the late, or also sometimes called the later Middle Ages, so either one. You can see the dates on them. Usually early Middle Ages, it's about half the period of most 500 to about 1,000 CE. Uh, during that time, that's when the Dark Ages really come in, and there's a decline in civilization uh, overall. Uh, also, um, you have like the Vikings come, like especially at the end of the Middle Age, or early Middle Age, the Vikings start coming in, and they invade Europe and all that. Uh, high Middle Ages, uh, that's when you start seeing like these uh, – Medieval powers like France emerges as a power. England emerges as a power. Uh, the Crusades take place, which is the main thing I'll probably talk about uh, that happens in the high Middle Ages, the later. Uh, then you got the late or later Middle Ages. Uh, the most famous thing that happened during that time, of course, was the Renaissance. Uh, that happened starting in the 14th century, 1300s in Italy. Uh, also had the Black Death, which devastated a large amount of the population. Like wiped out a third of the population or more uh, in Europe. Now, medieval times itself uh, is a mix of cultures. So I've got a little thing I'll put up on the screen there for you. But 
Uh, it's really a mix of different cultures. It wasn't just one culture, more or less. Uh, predominantly, you already had the Romantic culture or Roman culture. Um, I think it's a Roman. Yeah, Roman culture, I guess we want to call it that. But Roman culture was one thing you already had uh, pretty much there. Uh, and then that became mixed with Germanic culture. So you even have this uh, intermarriaging of different peoples, like Roman Gaelic peoples or whatever there are that are pretty much uh, in in um, throughout most of Europe. So you get that happening where the two cultures kind of merge together. Uh, the Germanic language, you know, influences a lot of different languages later, like Spanish and German. Yeah, yeah Spanish, you know, French, you know, English, et cetera, all kind of come about uh, because of German influences over time. Um, and then don't forget about the Roman Catholic Church. That gets mixed in there too as well. And uh, over time, most of Europe from Spain to almost like Poland, I guess, becomes Catholic a lot uh, because of their influence. So that's kind of what medieval Europe is. It's kind of a mix of all those cultures, other cultures too that are there, but they're that's the majority of the cultures that make up most of medieval Europe. So it's kind of a mix of culture uh, overall. So it's kind of like creating this new Europe uh, being developed at that point uh, after the Roman Empire fell. Now, there are different states that emerged. The one I will talk about the most that was, the, you know, the most famous was the so-called Kingdom of the Franks that would emerge. That one was the most famous and most powerful medieval state uh, that develops in the early Middle Ages. Uh, these were Germanic peoples I talked about before that had come out of Western Germany, Western Central Germany. They crossed the Rhine River sometime in the 5th century. They settled in Gaul as part of the Roman Empire, which later became France, as they called it. Or uh, the th real term they call it is Francia. You know, Francia. And um, which later became France. And uh, the Franks, a lot of their history, I don't have that in there, but a lot of their history was told by this Rome, uh, really a Gaelic Roman historian named um, Gregory of Tours. Uh, he wrote like a history of the Franks, it's called. And that's where we get a lot of our information about who they were, uh, the Franks. And he goes into and he talks about the so-called Merovingian dynasty, which you may have heard of, that emerged as part of the kingdom of the Franks uh, overall. Gregor of Tours is probably one of your first um, historians that really comes about at that time. Uh, and a lot of the historians were like in the church. I think he was a monk. I can't remember if he was, can, uh, I, think he, I thought he was canonized. I can't remember about that one or not. But he talks about the Merovingians. The Merovingians was like one of like two different um, dynasties uh, of the Franks. The other one was called the Carolingian dynasty. And uh, they, they came to power, they think, sometime at the end of the fifth century. It was right after the Roman Empire fell uh, in the West. And so the kingdom of the Franks was founded about the year 481. Uh, and um, the king that founded it was a king named King Clovis. So it's called Clovis I, which is, by the way, Latin for Louis. If you know about the French, Louis, there's been a lot of Louis kings. I think I've been like, I don't know how many there were. Um, 18 of them, I think. Yeah, yeah, 18 kings with the name Louis uh, in France. He's like the first one of the first ones. Uh, and we have that use that name. Uh, and uh, Clovis was um, the grandson of a king named Merovich. Who was Merovich? Merovich was some kind of uh, early uh, Frankish ruler or chieftain. Uh, that lived in about the mid fifth century. And he helped actually uh, the Romans defeat Attila the Hunt when he invaded France, 451. So he's kind of a legendary figure. So the name Merovingian is derived from that name. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Pete Merovich, who was a basketball player at Ellis, Louisiana State University, who's real famous, called Pistol Pete. You know, the name Merovich is, is evolved from the name Merovich, which you're looking at. So it's kind of a Germanic name. Um, the term Merovingian, by the way, though, came from um, that name. Uh, but uh, like I said, that's, that's where the name came from, like I'm talking about. Um, in fact, the name Merovingian supposedly means the, the translation, if you want it, 
It means the sons or also the descendants of Merovich. That's actually what it means. Uh, they did have a nickname. Uh, the Merovingians were called the long-haired kings uh, because they were famous for having long hair. Uh, I suppose it was a symbol of their power or something like that. Uh, so if a king lost his hair, he lost his power, that kind of deal. Uh, and the dynasty would be around, you can see, for almost 300 years. Uh, it's in power till like the eight, mid-8th century. I think that's actually 751. That's a typo, by the way. Um, 751C, I think, is when it ended. All right, now... Um, I need to also talk about what happened. Now, the early Frankish kingdom, it controlled, it didn't just control France. Uh, it controlled areas of what would be uh, Germany, like Bavaria, the Rhineland area, which is like in Western Germany, the Netherlands area. Now, we call it the Dutch Republic or the Dutch, call it Holland too. Uh, and then Belgium, Luxembourg. So all those areas were controlled at one point by them. They had a huge area. I think later they add like parts of Italy that they also control. Uh, the reason why the Merovingians are important uh, is that they're the ones that became one of the first major medieval Catholic state or kingdom that will form after the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, most other states, were, if they were Christian, I think they were Aryan Christians. And Clovis was supposedly the first to convert. You know, like around 496, so I think was the year. They say his wife was the one who talked him into converting. Uh, and so his whole kingdom of, over time converted. And then from there, they went on to, to spread it. Like the, the Franks, you know, would spread, you know, Catholicism all over Europe from Spain to Germany, et cetera, and Italy. Uh, and so that's something that they became well known to. Um, and I guess later it spread to England, you know, and all that too. Uh, the only thing about the Merovingian kings later, they became, by the 7th century, they became figureheads. They weren't very powerful. Uh, it was more like a ceremonial position uh, over time. And what happened was they were replaced by this um, royal official that became known as the major domo, which in Latin means mayor of the palace. Or some say house, if you want, because domo can mean house as well. And um, the... Major Domo um, was like started out as like the uh, king's manager of his household, like he ran his palace and all that. That's what he started doing. But over time, what happened was, if you ever study like modern times or maybe medieval Japan and all that, where they got the shoguns and all that, that's kind of what they were. They were kind of like a cross between a shogun and a prime minister, is what the Major Domo was. And uh, they're the ones that had all the real power. Like control the military, all the different uh, political policies and all that of the state uh, were pretty much done by them. Uh, and uh, this happened like in the 7th and 18th, 8th, 8th centuries uh, in the Frankish kingdom. Uh, the most famous major demos they had were, of course, the, the Pippinids, uh, which were a series of, of Frankish um, uh, major demos that, that ruled they're like an aristocratic like family that were kind of involved in it. And they were from like Northern Germany, uh, close to where Netherlands and Belgium is, uh, an area called uh, Austrasia is what they called it. And um, they would go on to dominate pretty much the power behind the throne. And of course, one of the most famous early on, they always talk about uh, is uh, Charles Martel. Martel, of course, was considered to be one of the leading major domos uh, that would become more powerful than the king uh, as a whole. And uh, Martel was a nickname. His actual Latin name, if you want to know, was um, Carolus Magna, yeah, Car Carolus Martellus. Yeah, Carolus Martellus is his name, uh, which means um, Charles the Hammer. He was called the Hammer. And um, he was called the Hammer because of his military exploits. He was mainly known as a general. Uh, fighting under the Franks. He was also a political statesman. And um, in uh, the 730s, uh, he was successful in a, a series of uh, military victories against the Moors, who tried to invade France from Spain. 
Uh, who were the Moors? The Moors were more, uh, were uh, peoples that were from North Africa, like you know where Morocco is today, and maybe Algeria, and uh, they were a mixture of like Arab and Berber, and I think maybe even some people think African as well. Some of them, and um, anyway, they had conquered the uh, Iberian Peninsula. In fact, the Moors had helped to wipe out. Uh, what was the Visigothic kingdom that had been there before. It, it got destroyed uh, by them and taken over by the 710s. And then about 20 years later or so, the uh, Moors then tried to invade France, uh, which they did by crossing the Pyrenees, most using cavalry forces. And um, what happened was Martel in Western France uh, defeated them uh, in 732, October 732, how it became known as the Battle of Tours, that's called. Uh, and um, the Franks were actually outnumbered. Uh, they had infantry and no cavalry. Uh, but they were able to defeat a larger force of the Moors, which were mostly cavalry. And uh, Tours was important because it, it forced the Moors to retreat back to Spain. And then it cemented, they think, Frankish power in France. Because, uh, you know, if I think if the, Franks would have lost uh, those battles against the against the Moors. Uh, they may have taken over France, and then from there, they think Islam would have spread e uh, eastward across Europe, uh, which they think may have wiped out the Catholic faith. They could have uh, at one point, or forced its decline, uh, more or less. So they do think that this event, the Battle of Tours, was kind of a turning point for Catholicism in Europe. Uh, help solidify it and preserve the Catholic faith and all that. Uh, Charles also had a son named Pepin. They call him Pepin the Third or Pepin the Short. He came in around 741, and um, he was a major domo. Uh, and what happened was uh, Pepin was the last one that really um, was a major domo. He decided that uh, at that point the Real power was in their hands, you know, the major domos. And so what happened was um, he was able to seize eventually the Frankish throne, basically took it over, which I think happened about 751. So about mid 8th century, uh, they think CE this occurs. And um, he founds the uh, Carolingian dynasty of uh, Pepin, which he named after his father, or was named after his father, Carolus. And so it became known as. Carolingian, that's what they dubbed it. So Carolus is the Latin name for Charles, or also Carl, if you want as well. So that's that's basically at that point what happened uh, with you know um, with the Franks. Now I need to move on, of course, and talk about. Uh, so that's like you know what happened with that uh, Merovingians going out, and then you got the Carolingians coming in at that point with the Frankish state. They also have Charlemagne, who's also famous as well. Uh, Charlemagne, of course, um, <clears throat> was named originally Charles. Charles was the son of Pepin the third, or, or also, um, they called him also Pepin the short. And uh, he came to power in 768 uh, CE. Uh, he would reign till eight. That's the wrong date there, by the way. That should be 814. That uh, should be the date of when he reigned. Let me fix that. That's not correct. Uh, that, but that's that's the actual date he reigned. He reigned a long time, by the way, which is almost 50 years. And um, Charles became the king of the Franks, later, of course, known as an emperor. And uh, he was later called Charlemagne, which uh, means, by the way, from his Latin name, Carolus Magnus. Uh, which is Charles the Great. Charlemagne, of course, is the French variation of the name. They took the names uh, Carolus Magnus and they kind of became slurred together uh, as one name. He, of course, was considered to be the greatest king of the Franks. I think I've got a picture of him, uh, which is right here. Uh, Charlemagne, uh, of course, says king, but later they view him as like being like an emperor, pretty much. And um, like he was their greatest ruler, and uh, he would take the state 
like the kingdom of the Franks, and he would form it into an empire, which would later be dubbed uh, the so-called Carolingian Empire, although really the Franks called it still Francia. That's the name that they dubbed it. Uh, he is one of the longest and greatest kings of medieval times, especially in the early Middle Ages. So he's one of the greatest kings. And you can see 46 years. Well, that's actual dates. You see 768 uh, to 814. Uh, we do know a lot about, uh, of course, Charlemagne due to the fact that there were various writers that wrote about him. Uh, the most famous, of course, was Einhard, uh, who was a Christian uh, historian, monk, and writer. Uh, and uh, right after Charlemagne died, uh, he wrote a biography about Charlemagne's life. That's called the life of, it's actually called the life of Charles, but now they call it the life of Charlemagne. That's what they dub it now. And uh, Einhard was actually the personal secretary of Charlemagne, actually knew him. Uh, and um, Charlemagne was an impressive man. I don't know if you know this or not, but he was six foot four. He was huge, huge guy. Uh, very well learned. Uh, they say he actually knew like Latin still, because a lot of people at that time were, they weren't able to speak Latin much, except maybe the, I think in the Catholic Church, just the priests and all that knew Latin uh, overall. And um, he was also a big patron of like Christianity. Like one thing about Charlemagne, he was very famous for spreading Christianity, like all throughout his empire, like everywhere you go. He also built a lot of cathedrals and churches, you know, for Christianity, for Catholicism. And uh, Christians gave him nicknames like Iron Charles or the right arm of God uh, as well. So he was, of course, the Franks were, like I said, very close with the Catholic Church and the Pope and all that. And uh, he got so uh, close with them that uh, because the Franks were kind of seen as protectors of the Catholic Church, that in 800, if you know about this, on they think Christmas Day, December 25th, uh, the Pope of the Catholic Church, Pope Leo III, had uh, Charlemagne crowned as emperor. Uh, so the, the Catholic Church now viewed him as like, you know, viable or equal to like a Roman emperor uh, in the West. And uh, one of the titles he was given was either, so he was a king of the king of the Romans or some people say emperor of the Romans, I think is the popular name they like to also use as well. And uh, the Catholic Church basically um, was trying to kind of create this idea that there was a new Western Roman Empire. So they, they were attempting to kind of reestablish a Western Roman Empire, which I guess was a rival state to the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire that was trying to survive in the East and all that. But it was really a Germanic empire that was just Catholic, you know, is what it was. Uh, but what happened over time was that Charlemagne was seen as like the father of Europe. Uh, because if you know about a lot of the states that emerged like in Europe kind of break off uh, from his empire, like especially France and Germany will, will be the two main states, you know, that will emerge uh, pretty much like in Western Europe uh, overall. And uh, Germany itself, the one on the right there, uh, will um, eventually become nicknamed the Holy Roman Empire. It's mostly comprised of like different states in Germany and all of that. Charlemagne's usually seen as the founder of the Holy Roman Empire, like the first emperor of it. Although it's not, the, the actual name and title isn't really used till later, uh, closer to like the high Middle Ages, et cetera. I think I had pictures showing, like, where was it? Um, I, didn't, I didn't get to show it, but um, here's a map showing you his empire. So that was the areas, like, in the lighter green was where I think his state started. And then the areas that are in the darker green are areas that he either, either conquered and added or later was, was put in later uh, by Charlemagne. So you can see part of Spain, most of uh, France. Uh, northern Germany, like it's Saxony, southern Germany, Bavaria, pretty much all the area where the Netherlands is and 
Uh, Belgium, Luxembourg are all part of it. Also, most of Italy as well. So a good chunk of it. So, so yeah, the Romans had, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, the um, Charlemagne's empire, Carolingian empire was, was huge, huge empire. Uh, there's a picture of Einhard, of course, his biographer, Life of Charles or Life of Charlemagne, which is what they call it. Yeah, he was also known for building a lot of cathedrals. That's one thing. Like, here's one at Aachen, which is in western Germany. Uh, a lot of these were bombed during the war, you know, about that, and they had to rebuild them. So let me talk a few minutes also about, like, what happened to his empire. His empire didn't stay together, uh, if you know about it. Uh, and um, he has a son later named Louis. They call him Louis the Pious. I think he's the one that's actually called Louis the First sometimes. And uh, but he actually under him, uh, the empire uh, declined. He actually co-ruled with his father first. I think and then 814 he ruled by himself to about 840. He reigned a long time too. And um, Anyway, what happened was his sons eventually, uh, after um, he didn't actually die, I think they he became senile, Louis the Pious, and his sons put him in a uh, put him in a, a monastery to get rid of him. They started fighting over the whole empire from about eight forty to about eight forty three, uh, and his three sons were uh, Lothair, Pepin, and Louis the German. They were all grandsons of Charlemagne. They fought over the whole thing, and what happened was at eight forty three. His sons broke the whole empire up into like three parts, uh, Western Francia, Middle Francia, and Eastern Francia. Fancy names there, but that's what they called them. They broke it up. And uh, what happened was it led to the breakup of the whole, you know, um, Western Central uh, Europe. Uh, and that's where you get all this separation, where you get all these new countries that eventually emerge at that point, you know, like France and Western France, you have Germany and Eastern France, you have Italy, Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, Middle France. You have, so all that basically is going to emerge uh, after that to eventually occur. So uh, I'm going to talk about it later. Uh, of course, I don't have time. I look like we're running out of time today. Uh, but I am going to get, of course, later uh, next time, of course, into uh, talking about the Viking period. That's going to be our next big thing I'll talk about, which happens in the 9th, 11th centuries, the so-called Viking era or Viking age. So I'll get to that. I'll talk about the Crusades uh, also as well, which happened in the high Middle Ages and whatever else I can get in. Might be able to get in the Mongols or something like that or something like that maybe next time as well. But that's it for today, uh, pretty much, uh, for this lecture. Uh, like I said, uh, yeah, assignments-wise, looks like you just got the vocab pretty much what you got, that final one uh, to work on. Uh, I don't really have any other quizzes coming up except for the final because I'm working on it right now. I'm almost finished with the final exam, and I'm probably going to give it to you early, you know, maybe next week, like during Thanksgiving week, to start working on it, you know, ahead of time. So so I'm going to post this lecture later. Uh, that's pretty much it uh, for lecture on the uh, early part of the Middle Ages. But um, if you have any comments, questions, let me know about it, um, either through YouTube uh, or also if you got a question, just send me, you know, through my email, like an administrative question or whatever. So that's it for today. Hope you all have a, la a good week. This is pretty much our last main week of school, really, uh, even though we got, I think, Monday next week. But that's it for this week. Y'all take care and hope you all have a good rest of the week, like I said. So see you later.